Thank you, brother. Y'all are so sweet. Thank you. That's very kind. Hallelujah. Well, I know you've been sitting a while, so if you want to stand up or run around or something, that's all right. How y'all doing? Man, it's good to be home. It's been a while. We missed you guys. We've been having a good time serving God in Texas. In fact, all over the world, we've been, we've been since we were here last, I think we've been to Israel and England and Italy and last week we were up in Calgary, Alberta. And by the way, we took our skis with us and when we got through preaching, we went over and did a little skiing and and we try to have fun wherever we go. That's why when we come to New York, we met Dan and Ann last night, had a wonderful meal together, and Alan, and just had some sweet fellowship, and we always have a good time here. And it is a great honor to get to share Jesus with you. Lots happened in our lives since we were here last, and we'll share some of that. I know it's, it has in your lives, too. And uh, I just am uh, more determined than ever to see everything that God has placed in our heart come to fruition. There's a dream that Dan told me about many years ago about a hope center, a world change in place, and I still see it clearly. I still expect it to happen. God said he's going to do a quick work in these last days, and I think things are, things, some of the things that we saw, and some people get disappointed when it doesn't happen overnight. I started sewing for an airplane for my ministry about 18 years ago, and I just got one last year. So sometimes it takes a while. Sometimes, you know, that's God's business. The Bible says as long as earth remains, there'll be seed time and harvest. Seed time is not one word. There's seed when you sow, and then there's time when you wait on the Lord. And if you do those two things, God is not marked. Harvest is guaranteed. That's right. Amen. So we just got to keep waiting, keep believing, keep our hearts pure, stay in faith, stay in love. I got some holy information. You know, I'm not a pastor, so I don't know how Dan and Ann do that. I don't have that gift. It's just not what the anointing that's on my life. I was traveling, guys. We have a different uh, job to do and, and a different thing that God would help us accomplish. Even though I'm probably going to be submitting to you the same words that you've heard from them, but they're not going to sound like them because I can't. I'm from Texas, and I grew up in Georgia. And uh, in fact, I'm probably going to be eventually in the southern part of heaven where all the cornbread and the. <laughs> you know how that goes, so. <laughs> but we'll visit, right? <laughs> man, I, they took us for cannolis after, after the meal last night, and man, whoo. Man, that was awesome. Well, I've got some holy information, and that's what revelation is. It's just simply holy information. I don't, I live, I moved to Texas because God brought Kenneth Copeland and Gloria Copeland into my life back in 1990. And I learned so much from them. Well, first of all, God used them to heal my body. I'd had a heart attack, and the doctor said the heart cannot regenerate itself. And they took a picture, a CAT scan of my heart before Brother Copeland spoke to my heart. And they took a picture 10 months later of that same heart, and it had regenerated itself. And the doctors, it was so cool because when the doctors pulled out the first CAT scan and put it up on this light board, and then they put the second one up next to it, they thought that there had been a mistake that the people brought them the wrong CAT scan. And they kept, they kept looking at one and looking at the other and trying to find a mistake, but God did what man can't do. And the doctors, I kept telling them, God touched my heart and gave me a miracle. And they, they just looked at each other like, yeah, right. So they probably won't get a new heart when they need one. But praise God, you can. Hallelujah. Amen. I mean, that baby was like a 16-year-old. That, that second picture was like brand new, I'm telling you. Glory to God. So, you know, I have some, what I teach when I go out and, and, and submit uh, the Word of God to you and, 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 and teach, I'm really more a teacher than a preacher. When I submit this holy information, it's up to you what you do with it. You think about it. You meditate on the Word of God. You either do something about it or you don't. Only you and God have total control over that. My job is to make it easy to understand. The Bible says that wisdom is the principal thing. 
But in our pursuit of wisdom, we should get understanding. In other words, that's the practical application. How do we do this? We heard what you said, God. Now, how do we put that on the street at our house? So my job is to make it simple and easy to understand. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about love because God is love. Say it with me. God is love. love. Or you could say it this way. Love is God. And there's a word in Scripture. You can turn these monitors down if you want to, gentlemen. They're booming a little bit. Um, there's, there's a word in Scripture called Selah. Thank you. Perfect. Selah means pause and think about it. The Word of God is simply God talking to us. Well, most Christians, especially frustrated Christians, spend most of their time in prayer talking to God. But the most important thing, I mean, I can tell God, and he wants me to talk to him about my needs and everything, but he has the answers. I don't, or I wouldn't be having to talk to God. Amen. How many of you know I, I'm Milan, but I'm not Jesus, and he called me to be like him. He told me, pick up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. In other words, be like me. And so... That's true Christianity is not going to church on Sunday and wearing a, you know, getting a fish on your bumper and a cross on your hat. Christianity is, Mylon, stop being like Mylon. Get rid of all your excuses. Quit talking and thinking about how hard this is or that is. And just get rid of all that pity party and all the drama queen and grow up and do what I said to do. In other words, stay in my word. He's, here's the way he said it. He said, don't let my word depart from your lips. In other words, keep words in your mouth that agree with me. Yes. Do not keep my, my law or my word before your eyes. Read it every day. And then think about it or meditate on it day and night. And he said, if you'll do those three things, you'll make your own way. You won't have to be begging me for success because you'll have such wisdom in, when, when the word of God gets into your heart, when it gets past your brain and gets into your heart, then when, when the devil attacks or, or something happens where you have to make an important decision, the Bible says, out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaks. Right. Now, if you fill the abundance of your heart with God's word, you will speak God's word when the time comes and you'll make the best deals. You'll buy the right house. You'll go to the right school. You'll choose the right wife or husband. You will make holy decisions that you won't have to beg God to fix later on. Because there are only two kind of Christians. There's those that obey God and those who do what they want to because they're the Lord of their own lives. Now, now Jesus is their Savior, but he's not their Lord. Do you understand the difference? I was a Christian. I grew up in a Christian home. I, my parents were Christians. My granddaddy was a preacher. My mother chose for her kids to go to church. And my daddy, I'm not sure he cared, but he was the enforcer at our house. He was the sergeant at arms. If my mother said her kids are going to church, my daddy would kill you if you didn't go to church. So I didn't go to church because I wanted to go to church or I love Jesus or anything. I wanted to go to church to stay alive. Does any, I'll be 70 next year. Does anybody remember when your, when your daddy could whip you and you couldn't sue him? Anybody remember those days? My daddy wasn't a very religious guy. He only had one scripture. If you spare the rod, you spoil the child. The only one I ever heard him quote. Anybody know what I'm talking about? So we went to church. But as soon as I got old enough where I didn't have to go anymore, I didn't go anymore. You know, Easter and Christmas, that kind of stuff. But I didn't go to worship God or to be involved or to be like these other Christians because there were so many Christians, and they were Christians. I mean, these people on their way to heaven, but they were carnal Christians. In other words, they went to church. They were very religious, but they didn't love God, and they didn't talk. They, they loved themselves, and they loved what they wanted, and they worked to get what they wanted, but they weren't seeking to be like Jesus, and so they weren't. And man, I mean, you know, when your granddaddy's the preacher and you go to his church and most of the people in the church you're kin to, you see what they do on Sunday, but you also see what they do on Friday night. <laughs> so I just didn't want to do that. I thought, man, it, you know, if being a Christian, if, if that's all, you know, 
Why do that? If I'm going to hell, I, I don't want to do it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Come on. So, you know, I, I, Elvis cut one of my songs when I was 17, and, and then Johnny, Ka I was in the Army. I was making $84 a month. That's what they paid a private in 1962, $84 a month, and Elvis cut one of my songs. And, and with my first check, I bought a Corvette and a Harley and a speedboat and a guitar and two pair of Levi's and some leather Converse All-Stars <laughs> in one day on a Thursday afternoon. And I was faced with a career decision. I can either stay in the Army 600 years or I can write another song. You know? So when I got out of the Army, I started a little band, and, and that band did pretty good, and we sold a few million records. And the problem with that was that when you get, uh, you know, you get around a lot of other musicians, those other musicians. Um, were my heroes, you know, the Beatles and the Stones, and and uh, I don't know if anybody's in here my age, but, um, you know, the people who I toured with, all those people were into drugs, and so, you know, I got in trouble, and, and all of the reasons I should have stayed in church that I should have wanted to go, you know, when I, I eventually OD'd, cocaine addict, heroin addict, almost 20 years, but I got born again in 1980, and I got filled with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And it was the most amazing thing. I went into this concert by a band called Second Chapter of Acts, and, uh, and I, I, they explained to me the difference in receiving Jesus as your Savior and receiving Jesus as your Lord and Master. And I knew I'd never done that. And I had asked God to forgive me many times, and I believed that Jesus was the Son of God, but I was a miserable, obviously, uh, just living in sin, you know, an adulterer, a liar, manipulator, all the stuff you are when, you're, when you don't love the Lord enough to trust Him or obey Him. And, uh, man, my life so changed that night. I was delivered. I didn't even know it, but I got delivered from drug addiction overnight. I never went through cold turkey. I never went through withdrawals. It was amazing. And I never took another drug, by the way, since that day. Which to me is the most amazing miracle of all. I mean, being forgiven of your sins is amazing, but to not want to ever get, when thinking you have to be stoned 24 hours a day and then never wanting to again, that's more amazing to me than not doing it. Not wanting to is amazing because I found what I was looking for. I was in love. I was in, in Christ, yes. and all of a sudden, I just didn't want to mess it up. I didn't want to mess with anybody that I wasn't married with. I didn't want, I mean, all of a sudden, my attitude toward everything in life changed that day because I got filled with the Spirit of the living God, and His anointing came upon my life. And if you're having struggles with anything, let me just tell you, if you'll give God everything, it's easy. You won't have any more struggles. You'll just make up your mind. I found something better than sin. I ain't doing it anymore. Right. You know, glory to God. So, Hallelujah. and I'm not saying I hadn't sinned since then. I have. I'm just saying I hadn't been stoned. I hadn't messed with any other women. I hadn't shot anybody or robbed any banks. <laughs> <laughs> but I have been proud. You know, when you judge somebody else, that's just self-righteousness. You decide you're more religious than they are and, and all that. That's just pride. That's sin. Yeah. So, yeah, I've had to repent many times, but glory to God, he set me free and free indeed. And, and he said, if you continue in my word, yeah. you'll know the truth. Yeah. And the truth will set you free. So I don't have to set myself free. All I have to do is continue in the word of God. Yeah. If I stay in the word every day, I will start to think like him and then acting like him and reacting like him becomes simple and easy. Yeah. Amen. So I got some holy information I'm going to give to you. I'm going to get my good looking wife up here. She's going to share a couple of things with you. And then we're going to get in the Word. And we're going to have a good time this morning. <laughs> Being a Christian is supposed to be fun. Yes. I believe God's people have more fun than anybody else. What do y'all think? Yes. As far as I'm concerned, let me, let me just tell you this. This is a no brainer. If you go into heaven, you ought to be in a better mood than if you go into hell. Yes. I'm going to see some teeth this morning. That's it. Come on. Christy LeFevre, y'all. Hi, good morning. <laughs> oh, I'm losing stuff. I got well, we are just so thankful and so excited to be here. The facility, we haven't seen it since you've made these changes. It looks beautiful. Awesome. 
And we just, we're thrilled for y'all and excited about what God's doing here. And we just want you to know we really love your pastors. Pastor Dan, Pastor Aunt Annie are close friends of ours. Yes. We celebrated our 15-year wedding anniversary a couple of days ago. <laughs> and, and they've been with us from the beginning. Well, we were engaged <laughs> so when I met you. So we're just honored to be here. We love them. We have the highest honor and respect in our hearts for them. And so you are blessed to have such anointed pastors. Yes. You can really follow them as they follow Christ. So I love you, Pastor Ian. Yes. And in fact, I laughed so much last night with her that I felt like I was in college again, hanging out with my girlfriends. <laughs> and my Mylon said, if you had been in college together, you would have never gotten any schoolwork done, Christia. <laughs> you and Annie would have been playing. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we had so much fun. So anyway, but I'll um, go quickly over this. We have some resources available, and it's downstairs and at the bookstore. And the reason why we make these available to you is just like Mylon said, Jesus said, if you will continue in my word, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. So the more we continue in the word, the freer we get. Amen. So this is the truth of God's word and music and teaching and video. Uh, the first one I want to bring up is Mylon's praise and worship CD titled Bow Down. And we do have lots of good praise and worship available at the table. You can check that out. We also have Mylon and Broken Heart. Every album the band did we have available on CD now. Uh, yes. Oh, Pastor Annie said the first album, Christian album she ever bought was Mine and Broken Heart. All right. I like that. Christian, <laughs> I mean, Christian album. Christian album, right. I and, bet you had a lot of those heathen records before that, no? <laughs> <laughs> You know, Pastor Dan and Pastor Annie used to help Mylon minister to the kids at the concerts and, and the grown-ups. That's right. So, And he didn't entrust that to just anybody, so they've been close friends for a long time. And uh, Oh, and then we also have uh, this teaching is titled, I want to bring up our latest teaching. This one's titled, Your Breakthrough is Right Under Your Nose. And I don't know what you may be facing today, but according to James chapter 3, no matter how big that situation is, we can steer the course of our future with our faith-filled words. Amen. In fact, I heard a minister say, I, I love this, he said, your faith must move your mouth before it'll move your mountain. How true that is. Amen. Amen. We got to speak to the mountain. And then the next one I want to bring up is, this is titled, How to Enjoy Being a Christian. And this is based on the, the truth that the whole kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Amen. So we really should be the most peaceful, the most joy-filled people on the planet. We should be the ones laughing more than anyone else. <laughs> and if we're not, then we need to find out why. Amen. And then we've also got Mylon's brand new teaching. He's going to go here today. The title of this is True Love, Learning to Love Others the Way that God Loves Us. And this is based, again, on the scripture that says our faith works by love. So if we get out of love, our faith won't work. And then we're wondering why our prayers aren't getting answered. So love's essential. And then the last one I'm going to bring up is my latest. And the title of this is... Don't be a sissy baby. <laughs> because, ladies, we are more than conquerors. And this is based on the scripture, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but he's given us the spirit of power and love and a sound mind. So that's what that teaching's about. We have a website. We're at www.mylon.org. You can get all the resources on the web, our itinerary, Mylon's bio. You can join us now on Facebook, Vimeo, YouTube, and Twitter. And um, everything on the table, by the way, is $10 each or three for 25. And if you, oh, and then also on the website, you can see some more of those BC pictures of Mylon before Christ. And we put those pictures on there. And I think they've got that. It's the, um, the next one. Oh, one more. And on the website, we put those pictures up there. And you can see that now. It's so that you can really see what the Lord has done. Yes. So we are thankful he is a new creature in Christ Amen. Jesus. <laughs> 
And we Thank are you, praising Lord. God for that. If you have any questions about our ministry, if you'd like to sign up to receive our free monthly uh, teaching through mail or email, we have brochures available. And that is it for our commercial. So thank you for your patience. And I just want to quickly encourage you that we really believe that 2013 is a year of the Lord's favor for us. A day when the free favors of God profusely abound. You know, abundance means too much favor. You know, one, one verse says he will surround us with favor like a shield. That means everywhere we go, we get favor. Come on. So I'll take it. How about you? <laughs> but the first part of receiving that, Galatians 3, 9 says that it's the people of faith that are favored by God. So first, you've got to choose to believe that this is a year of the Lord's That's favor. Right. And then second, you've got to decree it. Job twenty two twenty eight says, you shall decide and decree a thing and it shall be not maybe it shall be established for you and the light of god's favor shall shine upon your ways yeah. so that means when we decree the favor of god we get what the favor of god and then that verse goes further and explains how to apply it it says in verse 29 when they make you low now we all know who they are right when others say or do things that are disappointing or frustrating, or it could be those challenges or circumstances you're facing right now, when they make you low, here's how we're to respond. God says, you will say there is a lifting up. <laughs> Hallelujah. That means in the midst of the temptation to feel low, we believe we're being promoted. New King James says, when they cast you down, you will say, exaltation will come. Amen. Hallelujah. So it's time for us to lift up our eyes round about us and it went round about us and see and stop looking at how things are and begin to declare how they shall be that's it amen so will you say this after me if you're ready will you say 2013 2013 is a year is a year of the lord's favor of the lord's favor for me for me and i declare and i declare there is there is a lifting up a lifting up an exaltation an ex Exaltation will come. Will come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank, Thank you, Lord. Father. Amen. Thank you, Lord. It excites me that that scripture starts off with these words. You will decide. Before you decree, you get to choose. And some people think God decides whether you're blessed or not. That's not true. The reason that we weren't blessed, my family wasn't blessed. We lived in a trailer. We, were, we weren't poor. We were po. <laughs> if y'all don't know the difference, you ain't ever been po. We were on the other side of the tracks. It was dangerous where we lived. And the bottom line is we weren't tithers. We were robbing God. So, of course, the devil was, got to rob us, and he did a good job at it. And, uh, you know, the bottom line was we just... We were Christians, but we just didn't do anything God said, and we didn't really trust him. We did what we thought was best. We begged him to fix it all the time. <laughs> and you will have to do that. If you disobey God, if you ignore God, you know, Jesus is only the Lord of my life if I acknowledge him in all my ways. Yeah, exactly. He said, I am the way. Mm -hmm. Now, you can do it your way, but if you do it the way, you won't, have it, then you won't need it to be fixed because God doesn't make any mistakes. If I allow him to lead me by his spirit, everything I do will be successful. Amen. Now, you have to decide whether you believe that or not. In other words, if you did everything that God said, would you be very blessed or very, you know what I mean? The bottom line, here's what he said in Deuteronomy 30, 19. He said, I've set before you my word. Now choose you this day. And you, here's the choices. You can choose the blessing or the curse. You know, whatever is of the spirit gives life. Whatever is of the flesh, it creates corruption. And, and that is eventually death. 
Wages of sin is death. But he said, you can choose life or you can choose death. You can choose the blessing of obedience or you can choose the curse of ignoring me and being the Lord of your own life. The, what made my life, the quality of your life will exponentially get better when you decide I'm going to do what God said to do. And you'll realize, I'm not sure what that is. I better read this book every day. And when you start reading the Bible every day and really praying about what it says and seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness, all these things. What are things? God didn't say all these spiritual things. He said all these things will be added unto you. Things like cars and homes and what, what thing do you want? I wanted, you know, my first, I met my first wife in a bar. And you know how that ended. So when the second time, that's a no-brainer. I got born again and, and, and started, and, and started um, you know, serving God. I quit rock and roll where I made a lot of money and became a janitor at my church where I made $175 a week. And my ex-wife liked me being gone and sending home lots of money, but she didn't like being married to a tongue-talking janitor. When they came, you know, if you stop making a lot of money, they come get all your toys. And she didn't like it when they took her Mercedes <laughs> and I got a Honda. They took my Porsche and I got a Honda. And she left for a lot of reasons, praise the Lord. <laughs> I don't have time to go into all of them, but when I, I, you know, the Bible says it's not good for man to be alone. I said, yes, Lord. I got that one. I get that. But he said this, he said, if you'll do things my way, I'll overtake you with my blessings. And I said, Lord, you created somebody out there. You said man needs a helpmate. I agree, but you're the only one that knows who she is. I, I chose one time. I didn't do too good. <laughs> so the Lord added Christian to me 15 years ago, and, and man, my life has gotten better every day since then. I'm in love. Hmm. <laughs> Glory to God. Anyway, um, y'all join your faith with me. Let's pray right quick. Will you join your faith with me? We don't need, you don't need to hear any of my opinions. We need to hear God today. I do too. I do just as much as you do. I'm one of y'all. I'm not some hotshot preacher. I'm just somebody who need to be saved just like you. Need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Need the wisdom of God all day, every day. Will you pray with me? Father, sir, we come to you in the holy name of Jesus. And we ask you for and believe you for a fresh anointing today and for a door of utterance to be opened unto us by your Holy Spirit. Sir, I ask you to open the eyes of our understanding, cut the light on in our hearts and minds that we may see and know clearly exactly what your word means, not just what it says, that we may see clearly before us all day, every day, your perfect plan and purpose for our lives. Thank you for discernment. Thank you for granting us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the intimate knowledge of God. My master will be very careful to give you all the glory and the honor for it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, we're going to study love for a little while. I, I just got to say, where's Samuel? Man, that was some pop and drumming, my man. That's, that's what, where I come from. How old is Samuel? 14. Come on, somebody. The boy is knocking the bottom out of those suckers. I mean, I was, I was listening to that groove, and we call that fat back drumming where I come from. You know what I mean? He got the big foot. I mean, he's laying it down. And, uh, and I just got all excited, and it was such a good groove, and I was thinking, man, and I looked up there and saw how young he was, and I thought, man, look at what God can do in a young person. This is awesome. This is just precious, man. I'm just so thankful that we got him in the house of God. Now, we need to love him. If we don't treat him with the, if he gives everything he's got to Jesus, and for any reason we don't treat him with respect and honor, you know that the devil's gang will. Yeah. They paid me a whole lot of money to hang out with them. Yeah. And the church, when I tried to write my songs, when El Elvis cut one of my songs, it was a Christian song. But when I came into the church to play my, and down in the south where I live, in the Bible Belt in the 60s, 
50s when I was a teenager writing songs, they had a piano, or if they were rich, they had an organ. We didn't have an organ. But, you know, and they had, in the rich part of town, they had a choir and they had the robes alike and everything. Not us, man. We're lucky to have clothes where I live, you know. <laughs> but we're in there giving it all we got. But if you tried to stand up and do anything other than what they did, they wouldn't have that. The world treated me like a hero, but the, the church treated me like a jerk for writing songs that weren't in the hymnal. So we got to keep our kids in, you know what I mean? If we're going to keep them, they got to be loved and they got to be treated with dignity. And, and we all do. The reason I'm teaching on love right now is the reason we got some empty seats in here right now is because some people didn't get loved. I ain't talking about by the pastors. I'm talking about by the church. Jesus is the head of the church, but we're the body. When the, when the head tells the body to do something and the body don't do it, that's a dysfunctional body. If the church did exactly what God called it to do, you wouldn't be able to, we'd have to have church at the stadium. In the Coliseums. I used to work, I used to play Madison Square Garden. You know, I started out coming up here and doing, what was the first place we did? Bill Graham's, what was the name of that place? Oh. No, I started out playing this place that he had one in San Francisco and one here. Fillmore, Fillmore East. Yeah, and then we were eventually in Madison Square Garden and all those places. But I'm telling you, if, you, if we, the church, you know, right now, the church, we go out and we invite people to come to church. But here's what God said to me. If you'll live the way I told you to live, you won't have to invite anybody. They'll be knocking on your door saying, I knew you when you were in high school. You can't afford to live here. You ain't smart enough to own that car and it be paid for. Come on, somebody. They'll be knocking on our door saying, I don't know where you got this, but I want some of it. Take me to the source. And his name is Jesus. Now, the church is a living organism. It's not a building where people meet. People who are born again, that's the church. And if we don't judge each other, there's Methodists in this town and Baptists and Presbyterians and Lutherans and Catholics. And I mean, there's all kind of people that love Jesus. And how they serve God is none of my business. If they do it good or bad or ugly, that ain't none of my business. My business is to do what he told me to do. And that is love them. Not judge them, love them. Now, if he sends me over there and part of ministering to them includes correcting them and they get mad about that, that's not my fault as long as I do it in love. Amen. If I go over there because I'm self-righteous and try to tell everybody what to do, that's not love. That's, right. that's, that's my own agenda and that's pride. But if I go over there to serve those people and help them wherever there is, if I came here with no agenda other than to help you to be like Jesus, then there might be some correction in the teaching today. But it's not intentional. If I read your mail, it's not my fault. Because right. I don't know any of y'all what's going on in your life. But I do know the Holy Spirit told me to teach on this today. Let's look at John 15 and verse 12, please. Now, they're going to be putting some scriptures up here on the screen while I'm preaching that I sent them. And you're going to notice that from time to time, they're different versions of the Bible. My software has about 45 versions of the Bible. And since the Bible says when we're seeking wisdom that we should get understanding, I always put up the one that's easiest to understand as long as it um, sticks with the, you know, the original Greek. So... I'm going to look at John 15 and verse 12 in the NIV. It says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Now, please look at this very closely. This is not a suggestion. This is Jesus Christ talking. If you got one of those Bibles where the red words, this is hot stuff. This is the, Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ speaking. And by the way, this is the only commandment in the New Testament. Yep. That's right. He made one. Yep. Now, listen, because this is important. The Old Testament is very important. And, and Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. The Old Testament will still work for you. 
But we have a new and better covenant since Jesus came, and that's the New Testament. And in the New Testament, as you know, in the Old Testament, there were 10 commandments. And then, of course, the, the man added over 600 more commandments. That's what man always does. Man tries to take over and become the head of the church. And so they make more and more rules so that we all dress alike and speak in King James and do all that stuff. And you know what I mean? It, there are churches where if you don't wear a suit and tie, you're not holy. Believe me, there's churches I preached at for 15 years that when I decided a couple years ago, my, I had an operation and I couldn't get a haircut for a while and my hair grew a little bit and my wife said, I like long hair and I ain't had a haircut since then. Amen. She said, you look good in long hair, I'm gonna have it down to my feet. Come on, somebody. So, I mean, I ain't trying to please everybody. It's Jesus and her. That's all I'm talking about. So, in that order, by the way. Jesus said, you can throw all those other commandments. I'll read it to you in a minute, but, but you don't need but this one commandment. And, but he commanded us this. If you are a disciple of Jesus Christ and you consider yourself a mature Christian, then here's the commandment. And, and if we disobey the commandment, we're in sin. I'm wondering why our prayers aren't getting answered. People actually get mad at God because he doesn't do everything they want him to do. I, I, I hear this all the time. People call, they Facebook me. Well, I'm so mad at God. I asked him to do this and he didn't do it. And I, I ask him, well, look, you know, have you read what he asked you to do? And have you done all of that? Because obviously somebody's missing it. It's you or God. So I'm going to leave that alone. <laughs> well, you figure that one out, right? So God ain't missing it. But if we ignore him, he's got, the book is full of ifs. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and turn from their sins. If they don't, he ain't healing their land. It's, if is a covenant. It means you have a choice. Now, I'm, I'm telling you what I'll do if you'll do this. But if you won't do this, don't, get, don't say it's my fault. Come on. How many of you know just because you prayed, you don't get to be God? He's God, I'm just smiling. I don't make any of the rules, he makes them all. Amen. Well, here's the only one. Love each other the way I love you. Mm, mm, mm. Now, here's why this is so important. There's two kinds of love in the earth. There's the real love, the true love of God, that he has, by the way, shed abroad in our hearts by his spirit. If you're born again, you have the love of God in you. So when God tells you to love somebody the way he does, by the way, how does he love? Unconditionally. That's right. Jesus died for me and you, but he also died for Hitler and Bin Laden. Right. If they had accepted him, their lives would have been different. Whoever you can think of, the worst person you can think of, Jesus died for all of us. While we were yet sinners, we hadn't done anything to earn it. We weren't good guys. We weren't Christians. We were just sinners. And that's when he came to, to live and die for us. Now, he loves everybody the same, and he loves everybody unconditional. If you're unfaithful to him, he doesn't decide, okay, that makes me mad, so I'm going to be unfaithful to you. That's the way people love. There is a phony human love is a phony counterfeit of God's love. It's, it, it, it is totally dependent upon feelings. It has nothing to do with living by faith. You make me feel good, I'll make you feel good, unless I'm in a bad mood, or it's a stormy Monday, or I'm hormonally challenged, or my mother-in-law just moved in with me, or you know the dog bit me, or my boss is in a bad mood. And they got this list, and it goes on forever. I'm stressed out. That's why I'm being mean to you today, but I love you. It means if you give me what I want, I'll love you. That's what human love is. Human love is so changeable, it can, it can turn to hate and still be called love. It can have tender affection one moment and jealous rage the next, and people will still call it love. Every day, if you read the Internet, you just go to, to you know, I live in Texas, so if I, if I go to the Dallas Morning News there once in a while, I go to the airport, and there it is, and... You, if you read that, any day you can find people that are doing what they call a, 
uh, murder suicide. Somebody gets mad, they shoot their mate, and then they shoot themselves. Because if you don't love me, you ain't loving nobody else. You know, is that love? Of course not. Murder, suicide, any kind. I mean, every day in this city, probably 10 a day, as much many people as y'all got. But I mean, it is amazing how these people actually say things like this. Well, I married her because I fell out of love with her. You can't fall out of God. God is love. What is love? Because if we don't understand love, we ain't going to be able to do it. Love is not a mushy feeling that you get when somebody comes in the room. God doesn't feel all warm and mushy about us. Here's what love said. I'll never leave you or forsake you. It doesn't say if you do something mean. He said, I don't care what you do. I'm committed to you. Love is not a feeling. It's not an emotion. It's a commitment. It's a covenant. Yes. And we're either honest, godly people and we keep our covenants or we're not honest, godly people and we just go to church. Amen. That's only two choices. If we are loving people, then we're committed to each other. I don't know this brother's name, but I love you, man. And I'm committed to you. I want God's best in your life. Here's what that means. And it doesn't matter if he thinks the same way I do, votes the same way I do. He, he came from a different tradition, a different culture. Of course, we're not going to make all the same decisions. But he's my brother in Christ. According to the word of God, he and I are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We're going to inherit what the master inherits from his father. All of it. Everything. Not because I can earn it and I'm holy Joe. No, I'm just a guy. And Jesus, my master, told me, love this brother whether you know him or not. How do I do that? Because I have no feelings because I just now met him. In fact, we've never been introduced. I'm Milan. <laughs> Pleasure to meet you. But I can do it by faith because my master told me to, and anything he tells me to do, I can do it if I do it by faith. So I make a commitment to you. I'm praying for you. And I'm praying for you, buddy. And you're my sister. And I have a responsibility to be committed to you. To be committed to you. What is, commit what is my commitment? Since I don't know what's going on in your life, my commitment is I want God's best for you. And I want everything I want for me and my family, I want that for you. Yeah. And when I pray for me and my family and my daughter and my wife, I pray for my sister. Well, what if she doesn't do things the way I want? That's okay. What if she doesn't like the way I do them? That's okay too. I don't do them right all the time. The Bible says there's two sides to everything. We always think there's one. No, there's two sides to everything. And if we knew the other side, sometimes people are hurting. Sometimes people got all the, on their plate that they can handle and they need us to cut them some slack and be merciful. And they need us to love them unconditionally because that's what true love is. It's unconditional. You've made a decision before they do anything. Jesus made a decision before anybody accepted him. I'm going to live for you and I'm going to die for you and I'm going to say what my father said and I'm going to do what my father did and I'm going to do it right in front of you so that you'll understand how to do it and I'm going to give my life from you a, a, and there's a point of no return. Yeah. And he went to that cross knowing by totally by faith that God would get him. He went to hell. He didn't just die for our sins. The Bible says he went to hell for us so that we wouldn't have to go and whooped the devil, took the keys to death, hell, and the grave, rose again, and is seated at the right hand of the Father in the place of all power and authority. And we are seated now in heavenly places with him if we live the law of love. Now, you got to decide this is not a thing you can do as a reaction. This is a proactive thing. You have to make a decision before somebody does something nice or, or not nice. Am I going to love them anyway? Do I love the people who treat me with respect and honor 
or do I love the people who are jerks? Because how many of you know, if you have a good, healthy church, there's going to be some that are more mature than others. There are going to be some people in the, you know, that are sophomores. There's going to be some people in the third grade. There's going to be some people who just got saved and they're in kindergarten. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with being in the third grade yeah. unless you've been there 30 years. <laughs> Come on, if you're the only one shaving in the third grade, something's wrong, y'all. This is my commandment. Our Lord said, love each other. You can't fall out of love because love is a choice. It's a decision. You can't blame it. You can't just throw your, your wife away or your husband and say, you know, the fire's gone out or, or in other words it's not as romantic now that we have six kids and we have to work 40 hours a, a day you know what I mean <laughs> it's not as romantic of course it's not when all you got to do is date and every time the guy comes to see you he's wearing cologne and he's shaved <laughs> he's ironed his shirt he ain't scratching and picking you know what I mean he, he, come on it's easy to be in love. He's spending all his money. He's working all week to just spend all his money on you on Friday and Saturday. No, love is a commitment. It means when you wake up in the morning, you look over there, and y'all both got Godzilla breath and a, and a Don King hairdo, that you still committed. Right? You better be committed, because that's some ugly stuff over there getting up on so here's the bottom line, man. Who are we living for, Jesus or ourselves? We have to decide, am I willing to deny myself and pick up my cross and follow you, or do I want to just beg you to fix everything, make me rich, get, give me so much money, I don't even have to work, tell everybody to do what... I mean, people get married thinking their wife is going to do what they think they ought to do. Gentlemen, if you think you can make a woman do anything, you are deceived. I'm talking about any single people in here this morning. The others already know. Now, here's the choice I have. Am I going to do what God's called me to do? Because what she does is between her and Jesus. She's going to make her choices and her decisions. And she's going to receive her reward for how she chooses those. I can help, but I can't. It's not my job to dictate or control. My job is to lead. And, and, and here's the way he said to do it. Let's look at, um, let's look at Matthew 22 and verse 37, please. Matthew 22 and verse 37. And I put it up here in the living Bible version because I thought it was really easy to understand and love the Lord your God. They came to Jesus, you know, always trying to trick him, get him in something that controversial. And they said, what's the greatest of the Ten Commandments? And here's the way he answered them. Now notice so far we haven't read any words that Jesus didn't say personally. The first one was him, and this is him. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second most important is similar. Verse 39 says, love your neighbor as much as you do yourself. And then verse 40 says this, all the other commandments, Jesus talking, all the other commandments and all the demands of the prophets, that's Old Testament, stem from these two laws and are fulfilled if you obey them. Keep only these and you'll find that all the, you're obeying all the others. In other words, if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and you love your neighbor as much as you do yourself, you, you don't need a law about shooting people because you won't be shooting people if you love them. You won't be hitting on their wives or stealing their cars or, or lying to them or lying about them. And you know what I mean? If you love the Lord with all your heart, he said you'll keep all the commandments if you love your neighbor as much as you do yourself. These two. And that's why he told us here in, in, uh, in John 15, 12, my command is this, that you love each other as I have loved you. Now let's look at 1 John 4 and verse 7, please. And I think I put this up in the Living Bible too. 
Again, it's a real simple version. I put up scripture every day on Facebook if you uh, like to keep up with what we're learning. Uh, 1 John 4 and 7 says, Dear friends, let us practice loving each other, for love comes from God. We, we said he shed his love abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And those who are loving and kind, now I'm going to stop there for just a second. Notice he said, you, you got to practice loving each other. We were over in London uh, last year right before the Olympics. And um, right before the Olympics, the Olympic people had already come in about a month early. In fact, if we had to change the time we were going to minister because all the hotels were gone in London and within about a 30-mile uh, area over a month and a half in advance before the Olympics. Everybody came to get um, acclimated to the weather and the time zones so, you know, so they get their sleep right before their event. And uh, we came there early and they were already there practicing. The runners were running, the jumpers were jumping, the swimmers were swimming, the rowers were rowing. I mean, you know, they were all over town. Everywhere you went, you could see them in the places that were designated and they were practicing. What were they practicing? Some of these people practice for four years to do something that's over with in five seconds. But they practice how? All day, every day. Everything they eat for four years is practicing. Every time they get up and what they do all day, every day, it's the only thing they do. They're practicing for something that could be over in two minutes. And some of them, they don't do so good, they come back for four more years. And some of them come back for four more years. And Christians have a tendency to fuss a little bit if we have to practice loving each other. It takes practice to get good at something. I was in a band. I didn't want to be in a band that wasn't any good. I wanted to be, some bands play together. My band worked together. How do you get good? You play that song 400 times. You lock them in a room with no clocks and no windows and no phones, and you play that song until you're all breathing at the same time. And if one of you gets excited and your heartbeat changes, so does everybody's. And you learn that when you're jamming, you do that song, and if you decide to take a ride, you know the bass player's got six ways of getting from C to F, and when he takes, he looks at you. You know which way he's going. And all of a sudden, everybody's locked in, and you ain't having to watch you. You know, you've been playing that. You've been in a room by na 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 and you've done it so many thousands of times that you don't have to look down. You know which way he's going, and that thought causes your fingers to hit those notes, and all of a sudden you're on its own. And you're not making noise. You're making music. And there's melody, and there's rhythm, and there's syncopation, and there's harmony, and all of a sudden there's a great orchestration, and people can get into that dream anytime they want to, and they can enter in because it's easy to see. Amen. Or you can just play. You know, you can go, you can play at the Holiday Inn six nights a week, five sets a night for $250, or you can play at Madison Square Garden and make eight or 10 grand a day and have people flicking their book. It's a whole nother ball. It's completely different. When you write a song and they go on that dream with you, but that takes dedication. It takes practice. Here's what Jesus is saying. I want you to practice this till you get, till you become so efficient that when I, the head of the church, can have my way in your life. I want you to become such a mature Christian that I can use your lips anytime I want to to talk to somebody, that I can use your mind, that I can use your money to bless somebody if I want to, that I can use your marriage to help another marriage. In other words, can I live in you or do you want me to just fix things for you? Do you want to just live the way you want to and then beg me to fix it or would you like for me to come because he is if you're born again, the Bible says your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit. He's in there. You don't have to beg him to listen. He's always listening. In fact, he doesn't leave town when you are in a bad mood and you say something you shouldn't. You're praying. Exactly. He's always listening. You hit yourself on the thumb with a hammer, be careful what you pray because he is in here. 
Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit if you're born again. He's always available. He's always got all the power. He's always ready to heal. He's always ready to give you, a, get, give you favor in the boss's heart and get you a raise. It wasn't our idea. It was his. Read the book. It's in here. His idea is to bless us. His idea is to prosper us, to heal us, to save us, to forgive us, to love us all day, every day, and prove it. Show up at our house and do stuff nobody can do, stuff that you can't even ask or think, above and beyond what you can ask or think. Amen. What's he asking in return? Trust me and love me and love my people. How is he going to get loved if I refuse to love him? If I get hurt at something he does or says, and, and that's the only reason we got any empty seats in here. Do you know how many people this guy's led to Jesus? Enough to fill up the biggest church in town and, and then have to put a screen somewhere else. <laughs> but then when he corrected somebody, and people, and here's what's amazing. People come to you for counsel. Oh, pastor, what should I do about this? And then you tell them what the Bible says. It ain't like we got some special counseling book. We got the same Bible everybody else got. <laughs> And we don't get to choose what we tell people. We just have to tell them the truth. And if somebody says, and, and they'll tell you all their problems, they will, now they'll sit and tell you your problems for 10 hours. <laughs> but if you tell them the answer, which you can tell them in a minute, right, it's true. oh, but you don't understand, Pastor. In other words, that won't work for me. God's not smart enough to figure out my problems. No, I need to keep telling you for 10 more hours, so you need to pray that God will fix this for me. No, God ain't fixing nothing if you ignore him. If you want to be the Lord of your own life, he will step back and let you just do the dumbest stuff in town. He will let you run into the wall and you get a headache and you cry and my head's hurting, help me, Jesus. No, and, and the Lord's thinking, well, dummy, stop running in the wall. God's not a clown. Dear friends, let us practice love. And, come on, let's practice. For love comes from God, and those who are loving and kind show that they are children of God, and they're getting to know him better. In other words, they're growing up in love. They're growing up in God. Look at verse 8. But if a person isn't loving and kind, it shows that he doesn't know God, for God is love. Amen. If a person isn't loving, and notice this time he threw in something else and kind then he doesn't even know God for God is love he doesn't know that the love of God is different than the changeable feeling do what I want you to do love but love is committed to us 1 John 4 and verse 18 right down the page there I put this up in New King James because I think it's easier to understand. Verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect or mature love cast out fear. One version says all fear. Because fear involves torment, but he who, ha who fears has not yet been made perfect in love. Now, this is real important. When we were in school, we would, we would uh, study for a semester, and then they'd give us an exam a test, and that test would be graded and it would show us how much we've learned of that information that was available to us, correct? Okay, here's a test in verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love. In other words, when we grow up in God and we grow up in love and we become mature Christians, that casts out all fear because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not yet been made perfect in love. In other words, if you're afraid of flying, you're afraid of failure, you're afraid of the economy, you're afraid of you know, death, sickness, disease, rejection, there's a lot of things to be afraid of. The water, I mean, it's amazing. Man, at one time I was, I was teaching on fear and I had people come down at the end of the service and by the way, it's easy to get rid of fear. According to God, it's a spirit. It's not a feeling. I have not given you the spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. And by the way, you cannot have a sound mind while you're being tormented by a devil called fear. So taking some 
Xylex or Zonvazone or all that stuff that all that stuff that starts with Z and X, it will not get rid of a devil called fear. It'll put you, it'll make you stone so you don't feel as much of it. You can sit in the corner and stare for a while, but in order to get that devil out of your life, you got to rebuke it, bind it in the name of Jesus and cast it out and it'll be gone. There's no negotiating with Jesus. When, when Jesus told those multitude of legion of demons to go in those pigs, there was no, there was no lawyer, you know what I mean? That didn't go to court. Those, the, the devil always does what God tells it to. There's no negotiating. No fear in love. First John 4 and 20, right, right below there. If someone says, and I'm not even going to comment on this because this is cold and it, it's the truth and it's a no-brainer. If someone says, I love God, but he hates his brother or she hates her brother or sister, he or she is a liar for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? A Christian cannot hate. When Jesus said in Mark 11 that you could speak to mountains, he said, how the faith of God, whoever says to this mountain, and then he goes on and says, you speak to mountains in true faith and those mountains will move. But he said later, right down the chapter there, but when you stand praying, forgive, because nothing will move if you don't. If we don't forgive everybody of everything, our prayers don't get answered, and we don't get forgiven. Some people are sick, and some people have died over that one issue. They could have been healed. But faith works by love. If we get out of love, our faith don't work. Hallelujah. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 13, please. Now, this is the love chapter. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. This is called the love chapter, and this, every Christian who's been a Christian a while has, has read this, and I have read it so many times, I cannot tell you, and here I am after 32 years in the ministry, and I'm preaching on the love chapter again. Why am I doing that? Because I ain't got it yet. And I'm going to keep preaching until I get it, whether y'all do or not. Every time I've ever read this, I get under conviction. And I'm just being honest with you now. This is fess up time. Why do I get under conviction? Because when I really grow completely up in love, you know, there's one scripture in here that says, love hardly even notices when it's done wrong. I still notice. Will anybody else be honest this morning there's going to come a day where I don't even in other words how will I get from here to there because I asked the Lord that and here's what he told me he said forgiving is a choice you make before anything happens he said if you forgive everybody of everything and you don't want to go through any more drama then you got to make up your mind you know that people are going to do stuff this ain't heaven y'all this is New York Right? As long as you're in New York, there's going to be some jerks in New York, and there's going to be some at every church. Because they just hadn't grown up yet, and they still got the old way of thinking, but they'll, get, it, they'll be changed. We just keep loving them. Amen. They'll get the word. It'll keep, it'll have it. It does not come back void. Amen. Amen. God Amen. said that. So we just keep loving them, giving them the word, and, and, and it'll change. But in the meantime, we got to make up our mind two things. First of all, I forgive them before they do anything. Whatever it is, it don't matter. I've already chose. I'm going to be quick to forgive and slow to anger. The opposite of flesh. The flesh is quick to anger and slow to forgive. But God is slow to anger and quick to forgive. So once we make up that decision, here's the other decision. Whatever they do and whatever it, however it affects me, I'm going to cast the care of that on the Lord. That is not my care. I don't have to figure. Here's what he said. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that in due season he may exalt you. Casting on. And by the way, King James put a seven in there so we'd all know what verse we're on. But I want to remind you that the Bible, those New Testament, they were letters. There were no numbers in there. So verse six and seven go like this. Here's how you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. 
in due season he'll exalt you if you'll just continue to cast all your care on him because he cares for you. In other words, I can take care of somebody. I'm a big boy. I grew up in a tough neighborhood, and if you didn't, if you didn't put them up every once in a while in the school, when I was in high school, I was writing songs at 13, 14, 12 years old. I was writing songs, and I could always remember the drum line, the bass line, and the guitar, and the music, the melodies. The, I always remembered that, but I wouldn't remember the words if I didn't write them down. And if you're a kid in Georgia, a man, a boy, and you write things that rhyme, your masculinity will be questioned. <laughs> And you're, you, 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 you got some of those in your football locker and you're getting ready for practice and the boys see a poem, you'll be in a fight before the practice starts. So I grew up having to, um, you know, I was taught that way. I was taught. My dad told me there's certain things if a guy says, calls you a son of something that would be derogatory, concerning your mom my dad told me if you don't knock him down I'll knock you down my dad did he did what he said he would do I mean he was a tough guy and he, and he would whip you if you didn't whip the guy who did something that he thought was evil so I grew up thinking you got to fight now I found out the only fight I have to fight is the fight of faith I don't have to whip anybody I don't need a gun. Me and Dan were out walking last night, and you know what it's like at night in some parts of the city? But we don't need it. We have these giant angels with us, and they've been given charge over us to accompany us. If we go scuba diving, if we go skiing in the mountains, if we're out on our motorcycle, some people die in those situations, but we don't because we got these angels and they accompany us. And by the way, if I get on a plane with a terrorist, it don't matter because he won't be able to blow that plane up. No weapon formed against me will prosper. So those angels get on that plane with me and they accompany me, defend me, protect me, and deliver me. That's what they've been given charge over to do in my life. So I don't have to be afraid on a plane. Y'all remember the, the shoe bomber and the, the underwear bomber? Last year, a second and more effect, supposedly a higher tech underwear bomb guy. Remember that? Remember the underwear bomb guy in Detroit? Surely there's a better place to put a bomb. Just, just a, an opinion, but couldn't blow up his underwear. And then this year, they came out. Now, now the shoe bomb... We would never have known to pray, oh God, don't let anybody blow up their tennis shoes today in Jesus' name, or an underwear bomb. But here's the good news. If they make a bra bomb next week, no weapon. Whatever they come up with, they won't be able to blow it up if you're on there, if you believe it and say it. And if you stay in love because your prayers are religious hot air unless we stay in love and stay in faith. What honors God is I never stop believing him even if I don't understand and it don't look like it's worth it, working. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. That's what pastor said. And that means it doesn't matter whether I understand it. I trust God. What if it doesn't seem, people said to me, well, you've been praying for this for 20 years. What if it never happens? I don't care. On my last breath, I'm going to be expecting it in the next minute. Amen. Because that's the only way to honor God. The only way to show him I believe, I'm still preaching in the Hope Center. Freedom Center. Freedom, Freedom Center. Center. Freedom Center. <laughs> Where did I get Hope Center? <laughs> Duh. Two weeks ago, some other church. Oh, sorry. <laughs> they, they all look alike. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy. Now, if you could speak in the tongues of men and angels, you'd just be making noise without true love, the love of God being expressed toward everybody you come in contact with. If I have the, love, the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries, that means you know everything. There are no mysteries. In, all that God knows and have all knowledge. 
the knowledge of God. And if I have faith that can move mountains, I mean, you got the kind of faith where you go down to the hospital and everybody goes home healed. But do not have love, I'm nothing. If I give all my possessions to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast and do not have love, I gain nothing. What he's saying is, now, if you find somebody that knows everything and they have the gift of prophecy and they speak in tongues of angels and they got mountain moving faith, me and you would think that person's pretty heavy Christian. God said, and if they don't really love people, they're, uh, they're just religious jerks. Everybody in here, don't raise your hand, but everybody in here has known a Christian in your childhood that made you not want to be a Christian, that made it harder to, to find Christ. You were looking for love. You needed to be loved. Let me tell you something. I, I know some billionaires. When I was in rock and roll, I met some people who, you know, I knew all four of the Beatles, Elvis, Clapton, Dylan. I mean, I met a lot of folks and made a lot of music for a lot of years. And I can tell you right now that when, when George Harrison's wife ran off of there at Clapton, George Harrison were, could buy anything he wanted to, but all he wanted was his wife to love him. Man, if, there's nothing more wonderful than love. The other things in your life, if you have a castle but you're in there alone dying of cancer, you're not blessed. If nobody loves you and nobody cares, you, I don't care what you got, you're cursed. Love is what it's, God is, love. And he wants us love. He wants us to understand this. Now, I'm gonna, I've got a couple of little graphs here that I wanna share you, with you to help you remember what we've been talking about today. Because if you make the right choice, this is easy. It's not hard, you just have to practice it. I catch myself not doing it, and I've been working at it. I ask the Lord, how can, I wanna be like you, and I don't know how to give from here to there. I'm reading the Bible every day. I'm, I mean, I, you know, every year in January, we take a little time to do some fasting and praying. I know I don't look like I've been, I've, I've been praying more than fasting, huh? <laughs> But every year we set aside a little time, we try to get quiet and get still. And I always tell the Lord, and I, I talk to him about a lot of stuff, you know, and, but you cut off the phones and the internet and the TV and everything. It, it's, not, it's not normal. And by the way, it takes faith to do nothing. If you need to pay your bills and you just stop and you just get quiet and say, here I am, Lord, give me your instructions. I'm yours to command Obviously, I'm not like Jesus I've seen this year, but I don't know how to get there, and just, I want it more than anything, and I need you to speak to me. And every year, he tells me stuff, and I'm thinking, why didn't I know that last year? After 32 years, I ought to be growing up. And why does he have to make these major changes every year? But when he tells you something, it's important. So I told him, I want to be like Jesus. He said, well, then you're going to have to love like I do. That's right. If you want to be like me, you're going to have to unconditionally love, and you don't. And you know, when the Lord says something to you, ain't no use to argue. He got you red-handed. Yes, Lord, that's the only wise thing to say. Okay, I'm going to do this. Now, how do I do this? He said, practice it. It takes practice. And, and there will be a test. How many of you know that what you learn every Sunday, there will be? James said it like this. Is anybody having any trials, tribulations, and one version says, temptations. Then he said, then rejoice, because it's only the testing of your faith. It's a test. What is the test for? To find out where we are in Christ, where we really are, because we all think we're doing better than we're doing. So the bottom line is, do we, want, do we like it in kindergarten, or would we like to have our master's degree? Because everybody wants to be a millionaire. Everybody wants to hit the, the holy lotto. But the bottom line is, here's what God said. Okay, I'm offering you all the same deal. Will anybody be faithful in little things? If so, I'll make you governor over much. Everybody's offered the same deal. There's no, 
You don't have to have a certain education or be from a certain background or anything. All you have to do is say, hmm, I'll take that deal, God, and then spend the rest of your life doing your part. Amen. He'll do his. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Make you governor over much. Let's put up graph number one, and let me just submit a couple things to you because I think this will help you to see this clearly and understand it. Graph number one, the little heart obviously represents love. I just had my guy set this up and... Um, Love cast out fear. God is love, of course. Love cast out fear. Love is gentle and kind and patient. Love is almighty. God is almighty. He has all the power is what that means. The devil has no power over you unless you give it to him. Amen. Satan was defeated at Calvary. You do not have to be afraid of the devil. Amen. He was totally wiped out, defeated at Calvary. He was, he and all his demons were paraded before the angels of God in heaven as a defeated foe. Now he's still defeated, but that defeat is up to you to enforce. Amen. True. If you give him your power by believing in him when you get scared and things go bad and you start talking like the devil instead of like God, then you gave him that power, but he didn't have it over you until you gave it to him. And by the way, if you did that, you can take it back today. All you got to do is repent all those words and start speaking the words of God. That thing will turn around quick. So God is all love, and the secret place is just where you stay in love. He who dwells or lives every day in the secret place, in the presence of God, in the presence of love, he's hidden in the secret place. What does it mean? What's it, who's it a secret to? It ain't a secret to you because you're invited to live there. It's a secret to the devil. There's a place that you can live where he can't get at you. Amen. Hallelujah. And by the way, love never fails because it never quits. God has never given up on anybody. Man, you got to refuse him and you got to tell him you don't want. You, you choose it. You can't go to hell unless you want to. Love makes faith work because faith works by love. Let's go to the next graph, please. Hallelujah. Now, I put a few things around here. Love or the blessing of staying in love, living in love. These are some of them. Now, I could have made two or three hundred, but, you know, I ain't got much room here. Love will give you peace. My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives. Therefore, the world can't, it don't matter what they do. Politicians, Wall Street, it don't matter what anybody does. God said, I give you peace, safety, health, divine health, rest in my presence. You enter the rest by faith, prosperity, holy matrimony, deliverance, joy, mercy, favor. Again, you can make your own list and you'll be there all day. But the blessings of God are total and complete, and they're exponential. The longer you serve him, if you're doing it right, and here's what I mean by that, and here's the hard part. It's hard sometimes to recognize this. He said, be hot or be cold, but don't go to sleep in church. Don't go to sleep on me. Don't get lukewarm and get all comfy and just, and just relax in it because you need to come on and continue in my word, and you'll know the truth. Continue means every day. In other words, I know I've been talking a long time, but look up at me, please, for just a second. Here's what that means. Every decision you make for the rest of your life, if you are really in God, in love, if you are who he wants you to be, there will never be another decision that you don't consider the word of God first. Amen. If he's the Lord of my life, what he says is more important than what anybody else says, including me. Staying in love produces the blessings of love. Let's go to graph number three, please. The fruit of the Holy Spirit, which I put around about here, is what keeps you in love. It keeps you in the place of safety. It keeps you in the place where the anointing is fresh all day, every day, and the mercies of God are flowing freely. And that fruit of the Holy Spirit, I don't have time. It's a whole nother study. We can do some time, but it's in Galatians 5, 22. And, it's in, and here's what the fruit of the love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Those nine things are not the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They're the fruit right. that is produced 
in the life of someone who is submitted to the Holy Spirit and who is trying to do the word. And the reason we read it is not to be religious. We read it because I need my mind renewed. Your spirit's recreated, but your mind has to be renewed. If you want to be like Jesus, you have to learn to think like him. Amen. Amen. So he said, this fruit, I was, I was meditating on this fruit, and the Lord, I want to have what patience. I want to be a patient husband. I want to be a patient brother. I want to be kind, not belligerent, which some people call bold. How many of you know there's a nice word for everything? Fear? Well, that's just a little anxiety. No, that's a devil called fear. You know, so there's nice words for, but the, Jesus said gentleness. I'm supposed to be a gentleman, not sometimes when I'm opening my wife's door. All day, every day, I'm supposed to be a gentle person, kind, faithful, self-control. If you'd seen me going out of that cannoli last night, I was out of control, babe. <laughs> we don't have any of those in Texas. Love, joy, peace, goodness. I'm supposed to be a good man Amen. to everybody, not just, not just so I can say I have this fruit. No, I'm supposed to produce goodness to everybody I come in contact with. Amen. God wants me to be good to people. He wants them to see the difference in him living in me and somebody that he's not living in. My favorite scripture, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And blessed is the man who trusts in him. Bearing the fruit of the Holy Spirit, in other words, if you let the Holy Spirit lead you and produce this fruit, you'll stay in love. You'll stay in the safe place. <clears throat> and of course, we said this earlier, it requires forgiveness and casting all your care. What does that mean? I mean, something needs to be taken care of. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. If somebody does something really mean to me, I'm supposed to forgive them. And God will forgive them if they ask him. But if they keep doing that and they keep hurting his kids, eventually, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. In other words, he'll take care of that. I don't have to. I don't have to take them down. They'll take themselves down. Amen. Let's look at the works of the flesh. Graph number four, and we only got one more, and we're done. Somebody should say amen on that. Whoever's the hungriest and got to go to the bathroom should say Amen. <laughs> Couldn't get three amens, Pastor. I, all right. The, the works of the flesh, now we're out of love. This is outside of love. The works of the flesh are just simply unholy habits. We grew up thinking that's the way things are done because we saw it being done, maybe in our family, maybe in our friends, maybe our, wor our heroes, whatever. In, in my case, I saw it being done. I thought that was the way some people were successful and they got what they wanted and I wanted to get what I wanted. So I learned some bad habits of the flesh. There's no peace in there. There's no love in there. And now you're in the danger zone. When you get into the works of the flesh, you're in strife. When he started talking about envy, jealousy, division, strife, confusion, and eventually every evil work. Now, you know, do you know that that can happen to a Christian? Do you know how many great men and women of God we've seen who were doing great and mighty things, filled with the Spirit, teaching like a house on fire, and where are they now? Some of them are in jail. Some of them are, I mean, their whole lives are wiped out. What happened? They got into envy, jealousy, division, strife. Then they were so confused they couldn't hear God when they recognized I need to get out of this, I need to get back to where I need to be. They were so confused they didn't know the difference in God talking to them in their brain. And so they got into every evil work until it took them down. Strife and offense lead to destruction. They get you out of love. That's how the thief gets a key to your house. And if you give a, key, a thief a key to your house and he comes steals your TV, is it his fault, the devil's fault, or could it possibly be the dummy's fault who gave the thief a key? Amen. So we don't want to get out of love. Whatever it takes, 
when you invite the thief that comes to steal and kill and destroy into your life by disobeying God and getting out of love, he's going to start stealing and killing and, and, and destruction's going to begin. Amen? We, don't want, we, can, we can stop that. All right, let's put up the last one. This is the difference in feelings versus faith. And once you take the debate of offense... Once you take, you get offended at somebody. And by the way, Jesus didn't ask you not to do that. He said, great peace have they who love my law or my word. Nothing shall offend them. Amen. No thing, nothing anybody does or says will offend them ever again. Now, I, I spent a lot of time meditating on that one because I grew up getting offended. And my kinfolks, my daddy, he'd get offended at somebody and Forget. I mean, he got offended his own brother, and they didn't talk the rest of their lives. They quit hanging. I mean, that's what I thought was normal, and I had to learn. And you know, I'm, I'm telling you about my dad's. My dad got got it right with God, and he's in heaven now. But he did not enjoy his life near as much as he would have if he'd have done some of the stuff God told him to do. So I don't want. And I I was doing those same things, all of them, thinking that was the the way. Now, Jesus said, if you, the results of your life outside of love is, is unforgiveness, which will turn into bitterness, jealousy, anxiety, hopelessness, loneliness, sickness, disease, death, suicide, depression, grief and sorrow, divorce, unforgiveness. Again, you could make a, a thousand things on that list, but we ain't got room. How do we get how do we avoid those things? We stay in the fruit of the Holy Spirit. We make up our mind to love no matter what. This will be the best year of your life if you insist on staying in love. Amen. And if you insist, and that means, I ain't talking to y'all, I'm talking to me. Mylon, you are going to stay in love, son. You're not going to get out there where the devil can get a shot at you. Right. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes. Amen. You are going to stay in faith, son. And I don't want to hear anything else. David had to say it. King David, my hero, he's a man after God's own heart. King David said this. Be still, my soul. Let your mind, will, and emotions. He's basically saying, David, shut your big mouth. I don't want to hear from you. I know what you think, and I know how you feel. Be still, my soul, and know that he is God. Amen. It's he that's made us, not we ourselves. God is the one I'm talking about. He's the Lord of my life. Mylon is not. Mylon don't know how to be. Mylon's the one that messed everything up. Jesus is the one that fixed it. And he's got all kind of stuff he's willing to fix this year. If I'll just do this one commandment, love the Lord with all my heart and soul and mind and strength and love everybody else the way Jesus loves me. Now, here's the way Jesus loved me. I have done a lot of dumb stuff, said a lot of dumb things, got mad and said stuff that I shouldn't have said, and, and, you, know, and you can keep doing that. I know some people, again, third graders, they go around the same amount. Every time they take the test, they fail the test, and they think they're in the fourth grade because they're bigger, but they're not. <laughs> now, here's what I've noticed. At the end of the semester, you take a test. Now, if you're, in the, if you're a junior and you pass the test, you're a senior. If you don't pass the test, you can go to another school you can, tell, you can tell the new school, it was the teacher's fault. They weren't a good teacher. You can, you can go to another church. Well, I'm preaching good now. You can, go, you can go to another marriage. You can go to another job. You can go to another state. But when you get there, you're still going to be a junior until you pass the test. But here's the magnificent news of our holy, precious, merciful God. As soon as, and by the way, some people, the test's been going on for 29 years. Same test. But here's the good news. As soon as you pass the test, it's over. I get to choose whether the test lasts 10 years and I get frustrated going around the same amount, or I could just simply do what God tells me and go to the next grade. Go to a higher place in God, to the next pay grade. Hmm, I like that one. The favor of God is on those who favor God. He said, if you honor me, I'll honor you. 
The result of a life without love is a miserable Christian. A depressed, discouraged Christian whose prayers don't get answered and they wonder why God didn't do it. No, God never misses it. Now, I want to pray with you and uh, I'm going to lead you in confession. You people are used to that, so I don't even have to explain it. There's a lot of ways to pray. You know, Jesus said, bring me in remembrance of my word. The Bible says, you can remind me. I want you to remind me what I said. I want to know that you know the covenant and that you think it's holy and important. So talk to me about it. So confession is just, you know, you can close your eyes and bow your head or you can just confess the word of God. It's another form of praying and releasing your faith. Here's what the Lord told me concerning this when I was asking him how to do this. We say this in the out loud, but please don't just say it. I'm going to go slow because I want you to think about it. Selah means think about this. Say this with me. Father, I believe I receive the love of God that was shed abroad in my heart by your Holy Spirit. Now, you can't, do, you can't share his love if you don't believe it's in you. Amen? Say this. I'm born of love, filled with the spirit of love, and created to love. By love. By love. Holy Spirit, teach me how to love others the way you love me. Now, Mark 11 said, when you pray, believe you receive it. You just ask God to teach you to love the way he does. I want you to believe that you receive it right now. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yes. And then say this with me. Lord, I repent. Of all the works of my flesh, I take responsibility, and I refuse to live that way anymore. I refuse to be selfish and easily offended. I will not live my life in division and strife. I want you to just think about that for a second. That's a choice. I will not be an angry, frustrated, stressed out Christian. So I forgive everybody of everything. I set them free. Have mercy on them, God. And please give me wisdom as to how to have the right love relationship with them. Amen. And, and by the way, in some instances, that means get away from them. When, when you're trying to live a life of peace and joy and, and kindness and love and mercy, and, and you're trying to have an ordered life, a disciplined Christ-like life, and you're practicing love, and they won't practice, and they're trying to do right the opposite, then you need to forgive them and love them. But if, the, if every time you go over there, their dog bites you, you need to stay out of their yard. This is a prophetic utterance, y'all. <laughs> Thus saith the Lord, if they won't put the dog up because they don't mind you getting bit every time you come over, in fact, they'll bite you too. I don't care if they got the same last name as you. Stay out of their house. Love them. Pray for them. But keep that chaos and that, that what you know is diametrically opposed to what you're called to, you have to keep that at a safe distance and guard your heart so you can stay focused on what the Lord's doing saying. And this is the last thing. Say this with me. I cast all my care on the Lord because he cares for me. So today, I enter the rest of God by faith. I love everybody. As much as, as much as I do myself, in 